I'm ready to rock and roll here. Everybody ready? Okay, welcome everybody to this presentation. This is Gary Malik from Western Washington University on how to get the AV technology you expect. Thank you. So, um, other than Robert and Doug, who's been up to the university, I'll talk a little bit about Western real quick, just so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, Western uh, Washington University up in Bellingham has uh, about 15,000 uh, FTE students and um, I'm part of Academic Technology User Services and uh, we have about 140 classrooms, 130 of those are what we call fully mediated projector, computer, you know, the, what most people are calling a smart podium, that kind of stuff. Uh, we do our own designs if it's a large job like a new building coming online or something like that we contract out for AV integrators um, and we do all our own repair work and uh, the smaller installations you know upgrade remodels that kind of thing so um, what I want to talk about today what I hope you know I hope you guys walk away with um, is that there is a standard out there for AV implementation that works I know a lot of times we get out there and think we're doing this all on our own and uh, doing the best we can, but there's, but there's some guidelines out there. Maybe some of you have heard of some of you haven't. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it has been applied in a lot of different installations, um, and it can make our lives simpler. Let's face it, uh, uh, is anybody here not from the university? Are you anybody an integrator or anything? Okay, so everybody's um, in the same boat, if you will. Uh, so some of the problems, uh, some of the problems I've seen and going off to trainings at Infocom and stuff like that, the stuff I'm seeing is uh, first and foremost is uh, EDID. Does anybody not know what that acronym means? I'll define it if you like. Extended Display Identification Data. Um, that's where, you know, your computer or your source device is talking to the uh, display device and saying what what I can do, what I expect, timings, audio, all kinds of information, and um, we're finding a lot of uh, people are designing and installing systems and are not taking that into account. So uh, that's a problem. Uh, HDCP, CP, high definition content protection. Um, you know we're seeing Blu-rays played in the classic of the Blu-ray being played in the classroom. And if it's detecting uh, violations of uh, HDCP, it's not going to work. It'll not work very long. Uh, audio, I think we're always fighting, you know, poor audio. And uh, it might be loud enough, but is it intelligible? Is it stable? You know, the, like we heard down there in the room yesterday, the system's right on the verge of <laughs> going in the feedback. Um, screens, you know, a simple device that we don't think a lot about, but. You know, where are we placing them, what size, what aspect ratios, that kind of stuff. And then TED, that doesn't mean the TED Talk, uh, Total Equipment Database. Uh, if you're hiring an integrator, what are you getting from them at the end of the job? You know, it used to be you were lucky if you got a make, model, and serial number and quantity. And we need a lot more these days than, than, what, uh, than what, what we're getting, if you could say that. So, all in all, I want to talk about getting away from uh, poor quality. And that's, you know, we have some good integrators in this area. I'm not here to, you know, slam any of our uh, integrators, but uh, we are seeing in some areas some poor quality. So uh, the cost of poor quality. I took this slide from a class I took, um, and some of these apply to, if you just don't want to read to you here, but some of these apply to uh, AV integrators, but if you think about it, they turn around and give the cost to us half the time. So uh, a lot of these things, you know, time wasted, um, money wasted. Um, the uh, biggest one, if we have to get down and do uh, redesign work after something's been installed, uh, that can be uh, huge for us. Um, back to the, some of the items on that TED, the Total Equipment Database, that we'll talk a lot a little bit later. You know, we need passwords, IP addresses, what's the latest firmware updates that are being done. So um, the 
I think we can all relate to the never-ending punch list and you just after a while you just give up and you <laughs> take it as it is they get their money and yeah you hope they don't come back to, their, to your campus again but um, and for us for rooms all of us can relate for a room to be down it just we can't have it you know, rooms are too too important so um, the buzzword of the the talks and equality, let's define that. The simplest definition I like is conformance to requirements. And for us, that's making sure when I say they, the people that are doing our systems, in some cases, I don't, you know, we can take a poll, some of you might do all your own work, but making sure that we're fulfilling the bargain, whether we're an integrator or um, our own uh, installers and designers, that kind of stuff. So let's just keep that in mind, conforming to a requirement. I've got, <coughs> my eyes are getting bad, I gotta look at my notes here closer, so. Um, uh, there's a few different definitions out there other than the one I use uh, that some of you might be familiar with. If you've ever, I was in the Air Force for a while and we got into uh, TQM, Total Quality Management, that was the buzzword in the 90s. and. Uh, uh, some of these big gurus of quality, quality is fitness of use from Duran. Um, one of the ones I like here, it's uh, conformance, not elegance. A lot of times we tend to, um, in our society, well, if I got a, a highest end BMW, that's quality. Well, your requirement was to have a car that drives. You could have also a very good quality Chevy, you know. So it doesn't mean that we're looking for some fancy, shiny thing something that meets our requirements. Um, if any of you have ever taken any of the um, Infocom courses, I, I really like uh, Mario Maltese's quality, economy of effort, and profits are basically the same word. So, And I just like to wrap it up in that basically it's conformance uh, to requirements. So uh, an organization I want to talk a little bit about Full disclosure, I don't work for AQAV, and they're not paying me or anything like that. I just happen to take a couple of their courses and really like what they're doing. They're big on the, uh, they're really big on the East Coast. Um, I know University of Illinois has uh, really signed on to using them. Um, their website is aqav.org. Check it out, you'll find a lot more out about it. But um, as they say here, they want to talk about the art of designing. And for our stuff, let's face it, it is, there is an art to making this stuff work consistently uh, in, in the way we need it. And they focus on the quality management systems of, uh, I don't know what, why am I, there we go. The quality management systems of those who design and install that. Um, one thing, if you walked away from this, is just next time you're talking with a potential integrator or maybe you're, writing up your, uh, your request for proposals on a contract, just asking or making a statement, those that can show a quality uh, management system in, uh, in their company will be given pre uh, preference on a bid. You know, what are you guys doing to manage quality? Somebody, you know, I'm sorry to say, some of these guys are working so close to the bone, they're getting the system done, they're running down, you know, kind of catch me if you can mentality. Um, but we at the at a university or college wherever we need somebody with a quality management system and that's what AQAV this organization that we'll talk a little bit about is all about and who do they benefit are are us the end users um, some of the people that attended some of these courses I most of them I have to say were integrators probably maybe 20 percent were end users like like us in this room and these guys once they fully implement this uh, quality management system, they're seeing big savings, and they're actually able to pass it on to us, the end users. So, I hope you know. I hope it takes off on uh, here on the West Coast. Um, so, a little bit more about AQAB. They define standards for quality management, um, and they provide training. There's two main courses. I'll get into a second. Um, <laughs> They also do appraisal audits on AV systems. Uh, that's something uh, I'm really interested in for Western, and that is um, the, what I'll call the commissioning of an AV system. 
we we agreed on a design, you built it, now we're going to come in and make sure it performs to that agreed upon design standard. And then um, they actually do audits of the uh, companies that uh, sign on to their, um, to their system. So uh, I mentioned there's two courses. One is the uh, uh, CQT, Certified Quality Technician. You can read that there. The course is a three-day course. Um, and it is a nice combination of, you know, theory and like you guys sitting here and absorbing some information, but then it's applying it. Uh, in this course here, uh, you actually go out and uh, totally analyze uh, an audio system, um, including, you know, uh, checking for um, uh, how many dBs SPL if the listener is here in different locations, how do you decide those locations. Um, checking for uh, 15 dB or whatever your spec is of headroom, making sure it's stable, um, and uh, total harmonic distortion, all these things we throw around. But think of it, if your installer knows that you're going to come in or somebody is going to come in and check for that, well, they're going to build it. Don't you think a little bit better if I told you I'm going to, I don't want to surprise anybody um, if I was a commissioner. I don't want to come in with my fancy test gear and say, here, I'm here to burn you. No, I, I really want you to know, you're going to be checking for that, and you're going, to, you know, you're going to build it and test it and design it. So when I walk in the room, I'll push the right buttons, I'll check and say, you're on. You know? And so uh, that's what the CQT is. A lot of guys that are getting the CQT, um, they are basically going out and, and, and offering that uh, commissioning service um, to AV companies or schools, universities, that kind of thing. Uh, designer, uh, the designer course, a way to think of this, it's a lot easier to fix things on paper before we build them. Um, the um, uh, acoustical issues, you think about it, you build a room that, pardon my language, is an acoustical toilet. It's, it's going to be that way no matter what sound system you throw at it. Uh, we, uh, we need to have uh, designers that are looking at some of that stuff and modeling and using well, the tools that are out there. You know, let's face it, there's a lot of great tools out there. And uh, being able to do that um, before we ask a, an AV integration company to install this thing and you come in and just, I'm getting echo, echoing and um, intelligibility issues. What do we do? Well, we, you know, at that point, the room is built. We can't do anything. Uh, about it. So that's their two main things, CQD and CQT. Um, okay, so you'll notice a lot of these acronyms on here, the AV9000, and if you go to um, their website, you know, they'll mention that they are an ISO 9000. Real quick, another one of those acronyms that's been around. Uh, I don't think we deal with it much in our, in our world, but um, Here's kind of a brief synopsis of what a um, what a ISO 9000 uh, company would be. It's an international audible standard for quality management. Going back to that thing, asking your companies, do you have some way of managing your quality? Well, if you're an ISO 9000 company, you will, and you'll be checked on it. And um, it's a third party that comes in and does that audit uh, of their systems. The entire company, it's not like, um, it's not like, uh, okay, the boss and a couple of the guys in the upper office, they're talking quality. This has got to be from the young guy down in the loading dock that's loading up the truck, that's putting the gear out to your job, to the people ordering the parts, to the designers, to the technicians. Everybody's got to sign on to the quality issue because if somebody <coughs> screws up along the way, it's going to affect the quality. So when you hear that um, AB, uh, AQAV is ISO 9000, that's what we're looking at. So it's somebody from the outside coming in and, again, just speaking bluntly, making sure you got your stuff together. So um, a lot of the ISO 9000 stuff doesn't exactly work for AV. It's more geared towards, you know, automotive manufacturers, telecom, uh, aerospace, that kind of stuff. So. Um, they came up with this subset and got it approved. It was a, this was a big deal for them. They got this AB9000 approved. 
and uh, as they say here, the metrics for AV design impl implementation. And the key here, probably the uh, thing that, because I took both of their courses, you go through some checklists. You learn how to really work a checklist and check a system out at, uh, at various stages. Um, and so that's one of their keys. And they, they design these AV specific um, checklists that we'll, I'm going to actually show you a couple here in a little bit. Um, an audible standard, again, I think we all know if I've got somebody telling me I'm going to come in and check on this, so you might be doing it a little bit better um, in the end. That's a good thing. Um, and as they point out, they're very similar to what we find in, you know, um, the automotive industry and, and others like that. Um, and I really like this, that they focus on the buyer. We're the buyer. We're, we're the ones that are uh, giving them the money, and as they say here, we're paying for their lunch. So if we, everybody in this room, we sign on and start looking at some of these standards, um, we're going to be uh, hopefully doing something that others are going to follow in our footsteps. Um, as I mentioned, other, uh, we already find this precedent in other industries. If uh, you want to be selling parts for a Boeing airplane, you're going to be doing it in a certain way. There's just no questions about it. Now, granted, we're not making airplanes, but our stuff is important in our world. Um, and you know, as I say, it's not a consensus of opinions. It's it's uh, hard, checkable data. Um, so, uh, getting back to quality, um, a lot of times, if you talk about quality control. You talk about quality control. Before I worked at Western, I worked for an electronics manufacturer, <coughs> and um, they built a UPS uh, power supply system. <laughs> so basically, you go through this process, designing it, building it, and uh, assembling it. And in the end, somebody sticks it on a little test module. Does it do what it's supposed to do? No. Nope. Throw it in the bin for needing further repair, and um, you you go on. Well, we can't do that in our business. I can't have somebody build in room and go, eh, it sounds like garbage. Uh, image looks distorted. Um, things aren't working. You know, we, we can't have that kind of traditional stamped uh, at the factory quality control. What, what we talk about in um, AQAV is the quality assurance process. And I know this slide is horribly done, so pardon me, but you get the gist here. There's a there's a check at each step along the way, and a lot of this is. Um, I want to just take a little segue. Uh, Infocom has really um, been working hard, um, and, and the way uh, audiovisual is integrated with the construction industry. And there's a book if you haven't seen it. Um, audiovisual best practices. It's kind of deceiving because you, you expect to open it up and find out how to solder up an XLR connector or something, but that's not what this one is. It talks about um, basically how, how our world interfaces with the construction industry. Um, and uh, this, this book here gets really into that first stage, what they call the programming stage, which basically is what are we going to design for the customer, us. So if you, uh, I definitely, if you're in a position at your university or know somebody who is that's working with um, the construction industry to get your, your rooms built, it's a good book, really good. Um, but anyways, what the key is, they're, they're checking way back here at the beginning in the design process and saying, um, you know, I'll get, I'll get down into the nitty gritty. Customer said they wanted uh, a, you know, both an HDMI and a VGA input at the podium. Okay, that's a good idea. Good idea. And you, you're going through the design. You're saying, what are they doing with the audio from that HDMI connection? Yeah. Well, yeah. What do we do about that? You know. So it's a lot better to catch it then. Uh, spec the right kind of equipment, the right cables, the je you know. You, you've seen that where you built this beautiful podium, then you're gonna come afterwards with the you know, twenty dollar drill and drill some hole. You know. It just ruins, it ruins the quality of the work. But if you catch that way back in the beginning, um, uh, it makes it so much easier. A lot of these things, like I said, that you can't read because of my, my slide, 
Um, some of these apply more to AV integrators. There's a staging checklist. Uh, a lot of AV integrators will actually stage and build up the racks at their facility, check everything out, even get it down to putting the IP addresses in and all that stuff. So when they arrive on your site, they're taking these racks and putting them out. And so even then, catch the problems at the staging area. And then what the big one for us is going to be that final commissioning. I'm going to have on hand the original um, uh, design and saying, again, just to get specific, uh, I wanted this uh, certain laptop input. Um, where is that? Oh, I see it's there. Okay, we're going to check it. We're going to do that. So, um, but checking all along the way, so when we get done, we have a quality product, not some hodgepodge that you, that you don't want. Um, so the forums and the checklist, like I, like I told you that uh, spending a total of six days with the uh, AQAV folks, uh, you, you work the checklist. And after, you know, after the first run, I, I still remember we all sat down in the, in the design school and you look at what you have to check on a design. I mean, you think about it from, did you spec the right cables? Are they plenum rated where they need to be plenum rated? What size conduits are you putting in? You know, uh, all those little details that you know if you don't get them right, it's going to cause trouble. The first time you go through that checklist, it's really hard, but after a while, it gets easier. And, you know, we all like to think that we, we can remember every step of the way, but these checklists um, help you to do that. As it points out here, they're used by pilots and co-pilots. I think we're all a little bit... Uh, more comfortable in our airplane seat when you know that pilot went out there with that checklist for that particular airplane. You checked each and everything. He just, got, he just didn't wing it from, um, from his memory. And that's really good for us both in the design and in a commissioning um, and install <coughs> thing. Um, every system, every employee provides evidence. You know, I don't know about you, but when I have to sign off that I've done something, I'm not, you know, I for, you know, I'm not going to wing it. I'm sure none of you would either. So the checklist are uh, really important. Um, one I'll I'll mention here. They shared their. Uh, uh, Y'all remember the famous pilot Sully who took the plane down there in the Hudson, and when they were interviewing him, he said, you know, oh, that must have been this horrible thing. And it's like, no, we use the checklist. Water landing, we know what to do. Let's do it. And the, the stewardess, they knew what to do on organize the passengers and all that. Our, sometimes it seems like our life can be <laughs> like crashing on water, but uh, uh, to know that, that there's a checklist there that we can use to alleviate some of these problems, I think, is really important. Uh, and it is a discipline, a discipline and um, as they say, if adhered to. Uh, you, you've got to you've got to have that uh, discipline to to do that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference. This term here, they got non-conformers. Um, when you when you go through a checklist, you're going to create a report, and there's going to be some things that just don't conform. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, Einstein effect. What that is kind of in our mind. We have this mechanic. Uh, mechanized way of dealing with something and the checklist kind of gets us away from that so that we don't kind of revert back to old ideas uh, on dealing with things. Uh, I think that's where I wanted to kind of transition to looking at some of the, the checklists. Does anybody have any questions before I do that? Okay. <coughs> Back here in a second, I hope. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. So as I said earlier, there's uh, the design checklist, and to start out with, there's going to be uh, the way we were trained. Again, I don't know uh, how people want to implement this. Uh, maybe just a general idea. Maybe you want to uh, see about hiring uh, AV integrators that use this. 
but when you go through a checklist with AQAB, you're going to um, have what are called non-conformances, and basically that's items that make the system unacceptable. Um, observations, defects that require some action, but they're, you know, they're not going to hold you up from accepting it, and then performance notes that will um, basically, uh, as you as a uh, inspector, if you will, are saying, hey, I noticed this, might not <coughs> hold, hold up the design. Uh, some of the classic ones we had in the class was, um, you walk into a room, there's an equipment rack there that you know somebody's going to have to get into to adjust wireless microphone receiver volume on occasion. But right next to it in that dark room is, uh, is another electrical J box that's sticking out. Somebody's going to bump their head on that. Not going to, you know, your system's still going to work. It's mm -hmm. something that your client might want to know. Some, in your case, you know, something you might, uh, might want to take uh, an observation of. So that's what that's about. So back to the design. Uh, review checklist. This is a long checklist. Uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd run, uh, we got to be done at what time? Uh, 2.20? Yeah. Okay. Or 2.30 or? Anyways, I'm going to spend about a little bit of time on this, a little bit of time on the commission one. Uh, so let's just go through here. Some, and these are some of the things that I took away as being at a university. Either one, I'm seeing, we need, we, when I say we, I mean Western. Uh, maybe yeah. your folks as well need to improve upon is the pre-inspection. Talking about um, basically all that paperwork that comes together to put an AV package together, and to me, one of the most important things is the narrative. You hopefully uh, design this narrative with a lot of conversations with the end user, and you've uh, and that's where you find out about the things. Yes, we have. We have a boardroom where uh, clients come in with uh, various forms of laptops, so we want to make sure you can handle these different um, aspect ratios. And uh, uh, so, or um, we sometimes <coughs> need uh, six microphones at a table. And so it, it's a narrative that really discusses in layman's terms. I, I'm sure we've all looked at contracts where there's so much, there's you know, six pages of boilerplate on there and you can't get to the real meat of what the designer needs to do but having having that narrative there uh, is really important so you know at the end of the day I know we work for state agencies uh, a lot of us do and you that boiler, boilerplate has a um, uh, has a place but also there's a place for a really qualified narrative of the, mm -hmm. of the uh, thing so I'll go through here um, if any of you have ever taken any Infocom courses, any of the C, uh, CQD series or T, they are big on calculations. So here on um, image size, proper height for the application and viewing area. I don't know why it happens, but we in installed AV, a lot of times you get the screen size up on the wall and, you're, and you ever wonder, well, who said we needed that size screen? Or why is it in that position in the room? Um, and if you're hiring a designer, if you have a designer on your staff, maybe uh, ask the question: How did you come up with that? What uh, what criteria did you use? And there's a lot of good calculations out there. Um, another book uh, I'll show you here. Again, I'm not being paid by Infocom. I just <laughs> like their product. <laughs> uh, the AV installation handbook. It goes through everything of what a good RCA connector looks like when it's soldered up to calculating some of this different uh, different stuff here you know there there is something called a visual acuity um, uh, calculation right here there is a dis there is a way to calculate display height again I think all these are what I would call worst case scenarios minimums but um, I would like to know if I'm paying for a system that somebody just didn't go eh, I thought you needed a six foot screen it looked good you know you know, we, we have the tools out there, and so you might ask them about that. Uh, the the EDID plan. This was, uh, I think, I think a lot of you know what EDID is, uh, as we said earlier, but we don't really realize that to you put in, anytime you've got multiple displays, that's where it bites you, because what are, what are you, what are you going to do? What? What resolution do you want on that screen, and how do you want it to get there? Um, 
if you've got equipment between, we all do, between that display and the source, how does it handle the EDID information? Um, you, know, you get, uh, you buy a certain router switcher like that. I can copy uh, the EDID from this output to this input. I can duplicate. I can emulate. I can buy those little EDID. I call them uh, fake out boxes. You can do a lot of stuff with EDID. And and if the designer, and we hope a modern AV designer is taking EDID into um, into account, but he's got to tell that. To, he's got to have that in his design so the, the poor installer knows, okay, when I'm setting up this uh, Xtron router, how, what am I doing with EDIT? And there, you know, it's right there in the owner's manual uh, what to do with it. But if the designer doesn't relay that, um, so the next time you do an AV design, if you're not doing it already, I'd highly suggest you ask the designer, what's your EDIT plan? And they can take, it can be a narrative. It can, we have to do these in the class. You could just write down, um, my main display is going to be that Hitachi projector, and uh, we're going to pass the EDID through all these. I've confirmed that um, the, the products are all EDID compliant. So if you walk away with anything, make sure you, you ask them about that. Um, sight lines. Uh, you ever walk into the room where you've got the seats that are, you know, staring at the pillar? <coughs> a sight line survey. Uh, again, Infocom's got tons of standards available for doing sight lines. Um, audio down here, input and output configurations. Now with HDMI, we've really got to ask what are, you know, I see that you're using the HDMI for audio. Do you have a DM better? Is it the right type of DM better? Um, what uh, what format? Where are you tapping it off? What you know, what are we doing with it? Um, contrast levels again. Uh, there's there's different uh, if you're using passive viewing or uh, you know, what we call uh, more analytical decision. Uh, we're going to think differently about a room that's being used in the engineering technology building for looking at CAD drawings than we are over in the, in, in the English department where we're watching some films. So. Uh, Ask the folks uh, the projector specking. How did you come up with those contrast ratios? And uh, again, there's plenty of you know, plenty of calculations and data out there for that. Um, getting into audio, um, get very specific. Your designer should get very specific. And again, I, like I told you in the classes they offer, it wasn't just yeah, yeah, sounds good. You know, they they don't they don't do that. At the design stage, there's something called PAG and NAG, potential acoustic gain and needed acoustic gain. A designer should be showing you some calculations on that. Um, I should always have a potential gain that is higher than my needed, or the room isn't going to work. You know, we're going to be always fighting feedback issues. Um, headroom level, very important. Uh, that you design a system. Uh, typical, typical system might be 60 to 70 dB FPL. A weighted at the ear level. Um, I definitely want something that's going to be able to go up 15 dB higher than that so I can um, uh, have a little bit of uh, room in the system, you know, for a loud talker or a mic dropping or something like that. And also checking that to make sure that it's uh, free of any. Um, Other other audio uh, ones on here. If it's a, uh, a space where you need um, um, ADA compliance with assisted listening, how's that being um, addressed? Uh, big time these days. We're doing lecture capture. How's the audio being dealt with? With that, you know, a lot of times that's forgotten um, along the way. Uh, control systems. Big thing that. Uh, is preached these days in control system. Uh, first, nothing should be more than three or four keystrokes away. You know, I hate these really deep menus that you get into. Let's face it, a professor doesn't have time to, to deal with that. And uh, really, um, this is the benefit for the person that's programming your, be it Crestron AMX, uh, 
uh, X-Crown, whatever control system you're using, uh, a real button-by-button -button description. When I push this, it's going to do this and this and this. So uh, not leaving it to chance. So if you think about it all along the way, the designer is going to design it. The uh, uh, person installing it is going to make sure it does that. And then when they come in and commission it, maybe you'll be the commissioner. You'll be able to say, yep, when I push this, the screens go up and the, the power goes on and whatever is needed there. Uh, yes? Um, 3.4.3. Can you, can you like explain that a little bit? All required <coughs> controls are available to a, a user. This includes any hidden protected engineering operator modes. Um, Does that mean to every user? Or? Well, that, that's a good one. That's, that's why I didn't highlight it in the red, because it probably doesn't apply to it. Um, when, what they're basically saying there, um, that there is a, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm turning the keys over to a system to you. You're what I'd call a super user. You've got to train your, your professors how to use it, but you yourself have to know how to get into those engineering modes. So even though they're hidden, they're not hidden from you, the person who needs to get get to it. And, and that's and that's given to you in some kind of narrative. Yes, when you need to get into the lens shift controls on that Hitachi projector, you yeah, you, know, you do this. And what in the you don't want to walk away from a uh, an, inter, an integrator shouldn't walk away from you being the only one who knows how to get get to those controls. That makes sense. Yeah. So hidden, but not hidden from you. Um, yeah, let's see. I want to move on to the commissioning one, so let me just see if there's been some other ones here. Um, <coughs> cabling, uh, something, we're kind of getting into some of these different things here. Uh, if you're you, you know, one of the big ones I, I see uh, people getting bit with are we're using a lot of uh, HD based T extenders or HDMI extenders over category cable. Um, read the fine print. There's ones out there that say, yeah, this will go 500 feet if you're using shielded and you shield it this way. You know, soldering the shield cable to the uh, metal uh, whatever you call it, shroud of the thing. You know, very specific. It's not just your everyday cramp on uh, RJ45 connectors. So making sure that if somebody's stuck in that kind of stuff, you're getting the right cables. I didn't have an exact area for that on a checklist, but that is where a lot of people are getting into uh, get some trouble with uh, Every uh, general AV there, every feature source. Okay, um, and back to the narrative, uh, making sure that every, every feature, every source is accounted for, you know, Let's face it, we're probably the only ones out there anymore wanting VHS playback. We're, as much as we like to say go away, it's not. So is there a way to do that? Is it provided? Um, I've, I've personally seen in our installations, yeah, they stuck an S-video connector or a composite video connector somewhere, but they didn't program any of the in-between stuff to communicate. So if, if the client, you, said you wanted it, it should be there. And This gets, you know, uh, kind of into the nitty gritty of some of this stuff, making sure that you, you're, you're specking conduits that have the right capacity. We use a lot of conduits, uh, making sure, uh, and again, back in our calculations, um, somebody somewhere should be showing um, you've got for all your different conduits, you got the different fill ratios. Uh, I certainly expect you know a designer to be showing me that uh, he's got uh, adequate conduit space for the cables he's expecting. Uh, racks are they serviceable? You know, for I think for us that's a big thing. It's the serviceability. I th you know, I, I think all of us have our own techs. We do our own stuff, and uh, if stuff is being built that isn't serviceable, um, I'm going to kind of wrap up the design check here, but um, uh, a really good, robust, understandable cable labeling scheme. <clears throat> if it's just a bunch of really nicely dressed 
cables that are all tie wrapped and look nice, but I either don't have a labeling uh, scheme there or it's not understandable or they put the connector or the label so close to the connector that I can't read it. But you know, I, I want something that uh, myself or other techs can go in and trace a wire and all that. So making sure um, that's done. Uh, what, I would, what I would call a, uh, a serviceable uh, cable length. I should be able to replace once or twice a bad connector before I have to go cut into that beautifully uh, tie-wrapped um, cable bundle. So I'd rather have a little nice S-curve in there than pulled so tight that when we have problems, we're going to have to do that. So uh, keeping in mind your technicians and what they've got to live with, let's face it, for a long, long time. Um, we talked about cable labeling. How many of you seen this? You spec one projector, they order the wrong lens. Um, that's something we, uh, it was on the final exam there in the, in the designer's course, is uh, you had the catch that they had spec the wrong lens for the size of screen that they had ordered. And let's face it, that's money. It, it goes back to that. We gotta reorder the lens, you gotta do this, do that. So somebody holding them to it on that. Okay, so that is all in the design phase. Hopefully you catch all those things and you make them uh, do that. In, <coughs> in the design phase, is there a, an aspect that covers things like, you know, all of a sudden Apple TV comes out and some of your, your design is A and now it's got to incorporate B. I mean, is there that sort of flexibility <coughs> built in or are you? Um, that's not a, that, if you were, if I was talking with you and you were saying design, design a system, you said that, in my mind I'd say, let's plan for the future, let's have some blank inputs on the, on the system. Sure. There isn't exactly a checklist that says, think of the future, but um, I think either as a good designer or a um, uh, person as a part of the team that's putting together the, the, the design, yeah, we don't want to think we're going to be stuck in this day forever. So answer your question. It's not there, but it's a good idea. Um, did I go back to this commission? So, uh, any of you ever seen a magazine called um, Sound and Communications? One of the industry publications. There's a, there's a guy in there, he writes an article called The Commish. And it, it, it's really uh, informative and entertaining to read. Uh, that's uh, James Maltese, and he's actually the CQT. Holder and he, he's part of a company. That's all they do. They um, they went in and did the entire uh, New York City Emergency Response Center uh, commissioning. Huge system, um, and uh, this is the checklist they use for doing that. So this stuff works, and it works in a big way. So, anyways, uh, I what I'm trying to do at Western is I'm trying to get in, as part of our contracts and that, that we're going to do our own in-house commissioning. We're still working on it. I'll tell you how it works out next year. Um, but uh, let's just go through. I think I highlighted a few things in here. And I only got about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to go through this unless you got questions. Um, a simple one, this might sound like, Gary, why are you suggesting this? But uh, verifying power receptacles are safe. It's a simple test. You don't know how to do it. You know, you basically get yourself a three-prong plug and extend the ground out. And you use your digital multimeter, one on the ground, and you check all the surfaces to make sure there's no stray voltages. We had over in our performing arts center, they put in a brand new digital Christie projector, Crestron control system, and all this. And uh, I came over. You know, a little war story. I came over there, and they're Gary, you use this system. Tell us, tell us what you want to do. And I said, well. You know, laptop, okay, check that out, HDMI, VGA, audio. I said, yeah, sometimes they bring in an old um, VHS player. Okay. They wheeled it, wheeled it over there in the cart, plugged in the power. I grabbed the uh, RCA connector, stuck it into the Crestron thing, and I drew a spark about that big. It's like, <laughs> 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 smoke. Um, combination of things. In that <laughs> rack was a plug, you know, the, 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 the three prong power plugs that we have hundreds and thousands of them on our campus. This one happened to be wired wrong. The ground and the hot were reversed. What? If I would have done that test, 
I would have saved about four thousand dollars worth of press down for equipment because I would have found hot welder down there. It's a good thing to do. And also, I'm glad I I got kind of shocked by it, both <laughs> physically and mentally. But uh, Two ways. <laughs> um, but imagine that would have been a professor. So simple test. Um, you might say, hey, that's not my job. I'm not an electrician, but hey, it's our equipment. So I definitely recommend that safety test. Then that kind of gets that. that gets you going there. Um, again, we get into serviceability here. Um, on the rack itself, all switches and receptacles shall, shall be logically and permanently labeled. Um, I'm real big on labeling. You know, you might know exactly what that stuff is, but let's face it, other people are going to work on it. So uh, another thing here, I talked about the service loops, always giving yourself a little bit of slack on there uh, for termination points. A lot of the stuff in here is just basically making uh, sure that uh, you're following, I'll refer back to uh, a, uh, the uh, Infocom best practices of, you know, cable separation, you know, we don't want to be running microphone, you know, stuff we all know. You don't want to run microphone cables and speak <coughs> cables. Um, you don't want to be extending uh, bend radiuses on cables, just general house uh, housekeeping. and. Uh, Again, with the category cables, uh, shoddy uh, install of these. Nobody should be using plastic twist ties on category cables. We want to be seeing, you know, Velcro or hook and loop, whatever you want to refer to it, because especially now we're pushing them to the limit with HD base T and uh, HDMI over cat cables. We're really, if you think about it, that's telephone cable. We're sending digital video over it, and so anytime we're not treating that right, you're going to have problems. So uh, just make sure your installers are doing that. Um, uh, okay, so developing a test plan um, with the audio uh, checking, I'm going to just, I'll kind of round out here because I'm getting near the end if you guys have any questions. But um, if you're doing your own commissioning or somebody's coming in and doing a commissioning, there should be. Um, a test plan. I don't want to just walk out there and stand in the middle of the auditorium with my uh, SPL meter and say, yeah, sounds good. You know, no, I'm going to check at these five locations. This is what I'm checking for. Um, this is the test signals I'm using. It's got to be really defined. One, so your your uh, your installers know that, and they're you know, especially getting in a large one where we're needing to aim the speakers, and um, uh, if you've got a uh, distributed system, there's different tests for that, so uh, making, sure you're, making sure you're doing all that, not just doing it uh, willy-nilly. And um, again, I think if you're back way back in the design phase, if you set stuff like this, I want 66 dB SPL, um, I don't, you know, don't want any more variation than this, I'm looking for a, a headroom of this, I'm going to be checking it, you know, this is getting techy, but hey, what we do, we're tanks. So, uh, really specifying this. Uh, one thing, uh, has anybody here had to deal with uh, STIPA? Do you know what STIPA is? Uh, speech, trans speech Transmissions Intelligibility uh, for Public Address System. And uh, if you, um, this is really big in like airports, uh, movie theaters, any place where there's a large amount of people. You can't have a crummy, unintelligible audio system when you're giving emergency evacuation information. So there's actually uh, your big um, test equipment manufacturers, NTI is the one I'm familiar with. Uh, they have a specific uh, STEPA test signal, and there's a specific test for it. Uh, zero being the absolute worst, one being the best, and I believe. Uh, depending on who you talk to, 0.62 is uh, considered uh, passable. And um, I don't, you know, I, I personally haven't seen anybody do this for a standard classroom AV system, but I think you would want to be looking at this if you're dealing with large lecture halls where you've got to uh, maybe make some emergency announcements. So uh, if you come across that, you might want to bring that up to your, your AV integrator and just say, hey, 
you do anything about Stipa, they look at you like, what are you talking about? Might be something. So, it's 320. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Unless you got any questions, that's all I got to say. I just have a, I have a couple. Uh, just, you, I'm, I'm glad you hit the commission part because commissioning now on our campus, as we go forward, has to occur by the outside vendor, especially when they're doing the install. And I think you're giving us a really good template of which to either, you know, take this, adjust it to whatever size space we've got that. Also, the world that um, we're starting to live in, in in terms of clients on campus reaching out to us is to have what we're referring to as requirements meetings or elicitation, which is project management terminology for sit with them and, and maybe have developed a checklist uh, like you've got here, but kind of in reverse fashion, gives us a sense of questions to ask yeah. and how to how to pull that information we want because everybody wants a giant flat screen TV. They don't know why they need it. They just need it because it's cool. The other department has one. Yeah, we want one because they have one. So yeah, so that that's something that I that I was a takeaway that I had. So anyone else? have any provisions for a retrofit for a horribly acoustic room that somebody just botched from the beginning yeah I mean I guess it depends on why is it horrible too much reflection going on a real high RT60 or something or? it's <laughs> it's a tiered room with a lot of windows and a tiered ceiling with acoustical tiles with plenum space up there and speakers pointing forward I think they tried down pointing speakers too. We use a polycom system with a couple of teardrop mics and then one at the, uh, at the podium. And I just battle the reflections and, and the echo so bad in there. <clears throat> so we've gone to two, you know, we've got two campuses that we use. So we have a sound structure on each side of it to make up for that echo canceling. <clears throat> Noise suppression and it's, it, it can be bad. Tell you what, if you wanna, if you wanna kind of write that, write that uh, up in an email to me, mm -hmm. if I okay. can, if I can't answer it, uh, uh, Mario, the guy who taught these classes, he's always he's looking for problems, so I'd be glad to. That'd be good. It's a good problem. You know, I've got some <laughs> cards up here. Please take one and. Uh, okay. And I'd uh, be glad to see what we can do for it. But yeah, I mean, like I said, after the fact, what can you do? Acoustical treatment. Um, a lot of people look at distributed sound systems. You know, the old 70 volt speakers as kind of super store and supermarket quality. You can do a lot of good quality mm -hmm. with distributed system. And um, so that might be something to look at. Yeah. It's one of those rooms that was never spec'd out for it. It just yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, audio is the after so. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay.